Hello, Glenn. Hey, Mary Louise. Good to see you. Good to see you too. You are sitting in New York. Uh, what's the, the view like from your window? Oh, I am. I'm in New York State, not New York City, though. Uh, okay. So I have a forest uh, out the window. Um, some forest inside, as you can see. As well. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're very lucky to be uh, outside the city and have some space around us. Yeah. Well, we are delighted at Craft NI to have you here. August is Craft Month in Northern Ireland and it's such a strong and successful uh, campaign uh, yet this year uh, for obvious reasons uh, the world has stopped and while we're kind of emerging blinking into this new normal we're still trying to find our feet particularly uh, for craftspeople as well um, we're very excited to have you as our guest, I mean, the, the background that you've got, museum curator, uh, craft, uh, senior scholar, writer, but how would you describe yourself, Glenn? Well, these days I am a writer, really. You know, the, um, the world has stopped, as you say, and I'm sure we'll talk about what that's meant for craft. I think it's made it maybe more evident how important craft is in uh, people's lives and really shown a new light on that. But um, because museums are really having to hit a kind of pause button, a lot of the projects that I've been working on have been pushed off at least until next year. So my curatorial activities have been a little less active and I've been getting to do a lot of writing. Um, I also have my own interview series that I'm doing with designers and makers. So, you know, through this kind of platform, like what we're doing now, I've been able to stay connected to people uh, despite the distancing. And that's, you know, I'm sitting in Belfast, you're sitting in, in New York State, there are people all over the world uh, tuned into this. Uh, and COVID-19, while terrible and tragic, has also opened up a, a world of communication. But we're talking about craft, we're talking about people wanting to handle something, to see it, to smell it, to, to understand the story. How, how is this strange new world going to impact on craft? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I feel like anybody who's in the prediction business at this moment is probably feeling a great wave of humility <laughs> because oh. no one could certainly have expected what's happened in 2020. Um, I think for craft, you know, on one level, it really reaffirms the individualism that one associates with craft and what I mean by that is simply that craftsmanship really is um, a way of building a world of creativity around oneself often without a lot of additional infrastructure and you think particularly of the needle crafts embroidery knitting um, sewing that sort of thing as uh, you know something that can be very very ambitious with almost no expenditure whatsoever and you'd need very little space to do it either but even potters woodworkers and others that i know who do have facilities at home um have been able to really almost be more productive more creative more exploratory than ever before i think what you don't have of course is the social framework around craft because you know for me the the real importance of it is that it's a way for an individual to position themselves creatively within a community. And that could be the community of other crafts people in that discipline, or it could be their customer and clientele base it could simply be their town or wherever they live. And that's the part that's obviously been shaken. Um, so, you know, one side of craft has suddenly been boosted and amplified. And you think of people making their sourdough breads or, you know, whatever they're doing, learning new crafts, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. But on the other side, the, the connective aspects of it, obviously, are really challenged. Um, and one arena in which I've seen a lot of that playing out is in education, which maybe we'll get onto, but, you know, it's so challenging for people teaching craft in art schools at the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's just one of many examples where the person themselves may have more time and, and opportunity than ever to explore their own uh, ideas and use their hands, but where that goes is obviously uh, very difficult, and, and it's just hard to say what that's going to look like in two or three years. 
from your own point of view then, uh, as somebody who's trying to encourage uh, us to look at the world in a different way? Uh, yeah. Excuse me, I've got sirens uh, in the in the Belfast landscape uh, uh, impinging on on uh, the, the chat here. But you talk about a world, particularly you've got a a, a book as well with a great title, "Fewer Better Things." Yeah. Ha, has COVID nineteen forced us to address that? I mean, you mentioned sourdough bread. I don't know how many people had WhatsApp groups with people swapping ingredients and how to do the starter. I actually had to mute it. I couldn't bear it anymore, but banana bread was being made. You know, the children were bored. You were getting them to do something. We were engaging with craft in a way that we had, we had stopped doing because of the apparent busyness of our lives. Hmm. Yeah, so it's very interesting for me to look back at that book, Fewer Better Things, in light of what's happened now. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the pandemic has forced people to attend to the material world around them, which is really what that book is about. It's encouraging people simply to pay attention to what's literally underfoot, you know, the chair you're sitting in, the clothes on your body, um, even these machines that we're using to communicate right now, which are real black boxes for many people. People just don't understand how they work or what's in them, what's gone into them um, in terms of human expertise. Um, so I don't think the pandemic has necessarily forced people to pay more attention to that. It certainly opened up a space where there is time and possibly even encouragement to do that. Certainly it's still possible to, you know, spend all your times on the screen and order everything you need from Amazon, which yeah. is not where we want to be. Um, but I think to the extent that it has encouraged a discovery of self-sufficiency and mm -hmm. also forced people to stay in the same place and, you know, looking at those walls day after day, maybe there is a kind of quieter, more introspective form of discovery and exploration that's different from capering around the world on, you know, ecologically damaging airplanes and, Certainly that, that may have a long-term positive impact and also a reconnection with the locality. You know, if, if you are forced to travel in a relatively circumscribed um, geographical location and, you know, try to figure out a way to be safe while doing that, then maybe that is also another form of discovery that will stick. Uh, again, hard to say, but I think certainly that um, it's a time where people can reconnect with craft if they wish. It's an exciting time, isn't it, from that point of view? Is, is this a, 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 a pivotal moment then in how we appreciate something that is handmade and local and has a story yeah. against something uh, that is bought, you know, at three in the morning on, a, 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 on your device in a massive online store? Yeah, I think the word exciting is interesting. I, I would agree that it is, but it also it's exciting in the way that terrifying things are exciting mm. as, as well, because, you know, it's been said by many people that this whole experience is really like a dress rehearsal for climate change and the disruptions that that will bring. And um, I'm certainly not somebody who thinks that craft is the answer to climate change because the economies of scale involved in addressing climate change are just not such that hand making can really solve the problem for us, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but it is a part of the solution. And I think that um, the reflection that the pandemic is hopefully bringing to us is um, something that might lead us to a more organic, balanced, sustainable way of life. But again, it's all to play for, you know, I don't think we can mm -hmm. take it for granted. Not at and all. even if you think about the political uh, fulcrum that we're at, certainly in this country, also in Britain. Um, you know, the decisions that are made over the course of the next year will be things that we're living with for the rest of our lives. Um, so, yeah, from Craft NI's perspective, you know, we're always interested in how we persuade people to buy, say, for example, the handmade mug. I have a, I have my cereal my porridge in the morning out of a bowl mm. that I know the potter. I know the craftsman. And, and I love that. I love that it's lasted. 
it, mm. I've had it about 15 years now, and I enjoy it as an item. Now, don't get me wrong, I'll still shop online. I'll still go to the big, um, big stores. But how can we, how can we persuade people to yeah. think that the handmade mug or the handmade cereal bowl is an option? Mm -hmm. I think the objects are really the best persuaders, okay. yeah. you know? So I, I think if you have the experience of owning even one thing like that, it will become abundantly clear to you why it is valuable and meaningful. And as you say, knowing the person who made it, oh. um, is a crucial part of that. And I, I feel like that is what we've lost really, you know, people will often talk about the idea that crafts are disappearing and I don't actually think that crafts in general are disappearing. There are probably more potters now, certainly more potters now than there were in the 18th century by probably an order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. what, what we lack is a situation where everybody knows a potter and expects that everything they eat off of will quite likely have been made by that potter. Mm -hmm. And if they break one, they know where to go, which is next door, you know? Yeah. So it's that, not to say that there wasn't a lot of global trade of ceramics in the 18th century, certainly there was, but everyday wares that people used functionally very often were based in these immediate social connections. And that's the thing that we're missing, yeah, right? I like that. That's it. It's the social connection. Yeah. Yeah. So the object is like a, it's like a glue that mm. ties the community together. Yeah. And the really important aspect of that is that the craftsperson becomes a trusted figure in the community. So that's another thing that is very persuasive if people are open to it. Um, you know, it's not a coincidence that just for example, when we think about the revolution here in America, the two mm. people we immediately think of as the most famous figures are Paul Revere and Betsy Ross. Mm -hmm. So a silversmith and a, a seamstress, right? Mm -hmm. And they become the emblematic figures of political change at that time. And that's because craftspeople are inherently trustworthy. They have to be because otherwise people wouldn't, you know, uh, <laughs> be clients of theirs. So, yeah. th so the, the dispersion and disruption of the connections of making have also robbed us of having those pillars of the community who are the craftspeople. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like creating um, a situation where those people are present for others and yeah. also the objects that they generate can be the, those anchors of meaning. That's I love that. I love that. I really do. I'm, I'm, I'm hugely interested in poetry. And there was a time, particularly here in Ireland, when, you know, poets, you know, they had posses. You know, they, had, they had like a, a tribe of people. They were, yeah. they were ranked, you know, up there. You know, they were in, in the upper echelons, the senior, um, I don't know, policy makers of, of society. You yeah. know, it, it, it's that fundamental shift. Uh, mm -hmm. that has that has that has changed and in that way that's we then have changed in our relation to yeah. to to that art or that craft yeah that's a great comparison Mary Louise you know the you could say that uh, craft is sort of the poetry of the material world and mm. mass production is the prose at least our yeah. version of the material world um, mm -hmm. Another thing I often think about is um, the comparison between craft and music, because in fact, I play Irish music myself. And Do you? Yeah, yeah. So um, th the way that tunes will circulate in communities of musicians, mm. and then you make your own thing Absolutely. of the tune once you've learned it. But all the things that you might do while you play are associated with specific people that you've heard play it, and a little variation there or an ornament there. And it becomes an accumulation of your personal connections with the music. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same way for a craft maker. You know, when they make something consciously or semi-consciously, they are the repository of all the other makers that they've known who have given them tips and instruction, mm -hmm. and insights into that discipline. Yeah. Because people talk even from, a, I, I love music as well. Um, I don't want to go off tangent because I know there are people watching and I, we do want your questions as well, just to, to let you know. Um, but uh, even um, I remember interviewing, because uh, I work in broadcasting, I remember interviewing a pianist, a, a concert pianist. And wow. it, it was a, it meant an awful lot to him that he was taught 
by and his teacher had been taught by Liszt. So you've got this this direct line so that mm. you're feeling that, you know, if she's been taught by Liszt, then she has got, has received his style, his nuances, his you know, things that he liked to do or didn't like to do. And so that then becomes part of, of uh, uh, the, this uh, classical pianist, his currency now, and he can pass that on. So lineage is incredibly important. That's right. And you know, in Japan, they, they have a very organized version of that kind of lineage. So the idea of being a living national treasure, which is the colloquial way of putting it. But technically what mm -hmm. those people are, are holders of intangible cultural properties. In other words, mm -hmm. they simply have had that intangible knowledge passed down to them. And they may or may not be actually descended from the family, you know. So if you're the 15th Raku Potter, you may literally be the grand child of the grandchild of the grandchild of the grandchild yeah. who founded that lineage or you might simply be adopted within it but even outside of a very organized and recognized version of that kind of um heritage structure you can still have the same idea you know if if you were taught by somebody who was taught by somebody who was taught by somebody then there's a kind of inherent quality of respect and Absolutely. Yeah. built up um, built up knowledge there that I think is that is what we should be thinking about when we think about a concept like tradition you know often tradition is used to mean something that's unchanging yeah. or static or even mm -hmm. backward looking mm -hmm. but it's hardly ever the case and in fact if you think about it given the pace of change in the modern world in general to keep a tradition seeming like it's standing still you have to be incredibly nimble and innovative because you have to constantly mm -hmm. shift to new conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. to be able to maintain that, that sense of continuity um, is a highly creative thing to do in its own right. So for me, tradition is actually uh, very bound up with the concept of innovation and the value of it is exactly what you're describing, that kind of handed downness. There's the, the word national treasure or words kind of, Give me the heebie-jeebies at time. I love what you said there about sort of being the intangible kind of owner of 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 inherited mm -hmm. secrets or I don't know something, but national yeah. treasure always gives it's 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 a it's a terrible description of something which is actually quite quite wonderful. Um, I I also want to talk to you as well because you're sitting in the states now. You've obviously got an interest in Ireland with with the the music and and you know you're your eye is obviously looking beyond uh, North America. What is the interest from the US audiences in, in UK and Irish crafts and culture? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I think you have to think of the UK and Ireland quite differently there. And I, when I say Ireland, of course, I mean both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, you know, I grew up in Boston, which is where I learned to play Irish music. And also spent time in Milwaukee, just north of Chicago, which is another great Irish American center. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. uh, I, I certainly don't think there's another expatriate community that has more affinity or energy devoted to its ancestral homeland than the Irish American community. So that's quite special. And I've been, you know, very close to it. Um, I do think it's a little more oriented to music and dance and possibly literature, as you earlier yeah. said. Yeah it is to crafts but they're definitely a part of it as well mm -hmm. um you know the story of crystal or belief porcelain or again various yeah. textiles um do you think we could push more do you think that that's an interesting point from a u.s uh point of view that you know would we be pushing the likes of shane matini and poetry uh, yeah. too much yeah. or the high-end brands like waterford crystal or belief pottery but should we be looking more from a yeah. craft ni point of view uh, of pushing the, the the craft the great innovative craft people that we yeah. have here i think it's it, i think there is a lot of potential for that and i think it really comes down to having these exemplary figures and stories to tell um i've been working a lot recently with joseph walsh the furniture designer and maker in cork and He's brilliant uh, yeah and you know someone like him you know over mm -hmm. here is received in this extremely enthusiastic way but it's also complicated you know because 
he's seen simultaneously as a leading figure in international design and also as an exemplar of Irish traditional, you know, um, know-how crafts mm. and uh, even the sort of cultural atmosphere of the country. He brings that with him. So that's so mm. rich. I think the, the story in Britain is a little different because Britain has, um, I would argue, the most intellectual posture of any craft culture that I've experienced. And I lived in Britain for eight years. My wife is British. So I have very strong connections there. I was at the Victoria and Albert Museum for, for, those, yeah. for that period yeah. of time. Mm. And I, I feel like um, the narratives about craft in relation to fine art and architecture and design and also the sense that craft is really a field of research mm -hmm. as well as a field of traditional knowledge. That's mm -hmm. very, very well developed there. And I think mm -hmm. that's been, at least in my experience, which leans in somewhat of an academic direction at times, I feel like that's really been what British craft means for Americans. It's a sort of thoughtfulness mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. kind of a high intellectual pitch. Okay. which is absolutely justified. I think that that does exist over there and, and uh, in a very deep way. I know you want to talk about education and I, I will come on to that. Uh, but before we leave the, the States, obviously post-Brexit, there's, a, there, there's a, a, a feeling that the US is uh, a really, I mean, it always was an important market, but it's more important than ever for, for UK artists, for designers, makers. So... Can you give us your thoughts on craft buyers in the US? I mean, what are their interests? What are their tastes? And I suppose what are their 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 price yeah. their price ceilings even, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the there you run headlong into the traditional problem of craft, which is that it tends to be expensive if it's any good. <laughs> so to the extent that craft yeah. is actually a legitimate enterprise rather than a superficial pretense you know we, we now have this term craft washing which is used to describe things that are actually mass produced but claim to have some kind of artisanal quality like okay, green water, okay you know, right. it to be ecological but isn't really so craft washing um okay and i i think leaving that kind of nonsense aside really what you have to think about is building very rigorous um venues and channels of communication and presentation that really tell the story of the craftsperson and also communicate the value, the cultural value on both the producer's end and the consumer's end. I think that has to be the way forward. And there have been lots of great examples of that, you know, um, galleries, museums, design fairs, uh, even online platforms increasingly have been very successful channels for insisting on that kind of uh, rigor and that kind of legitimacy. But I, I, I'm a real champion of that and not, mm. not trying to play a quantity game or a volume game, but really trying to play a quality game and keeping it focused and really attending to the uh, genuine integrity of the stories that you're telling. But there must be people, uh, whether they're watching this or they've sat and looked at somebody like Joseph's uh, star ascending and rightly so but why is it that certain people just punch through uh, yeah. should there not be a, a kind of a steady build a, 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 a sense that you know a directory this is where people go to find the, the, the it sort of seems that we, we tend to and it happened with Heaney as well with poetry you know that you get you get the star the star breaks through and then it seems to um uh, the other people who are behind him and with him and, and or her and are part of the gang that has made that uh, aspect, whether it be craft or poetry or music, viable and sustainable, yeah. they're kind of forgotten about. So how, 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 do, how do other people get that kind of international platform as well? Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, I think there's two different... Um, kinds of viable craft that we need to think about here. Okay. So there's the internationally um, conspicuous, very high profile kind of activity. And mm -hmm. I think that does, as you're saying, usually require a fairly large workshop and somebody with a lot of skills, you know, making skills, design skills, communication skills, wow. social skills, all yeah. in one uh, as a leader. 
And um, he also needed a, a good sort of financial backup as well to, to help uh, you through something like that. Yeah, or, or it simply built slowly and organically over time, okay. you know, okay. so that it formed its own kind of financial wherewithal. Mm. I, I, you know, I would want to also say, though, that that kind of validation isn't the only or even the most important kind of value that craft can bring to a culture, because, mm. you know, I mm. would definitely want to remember even the plumber that you might have come to your house or the person who's going to help yeah. rethatch your, your, your home or reshingle your home. Those mm. people are craftspeople yeah. too, very much so. And they're actually mm. more, I would say more typical of the kind mm -hmm. of value the craft brings to culture. So of course you will have mm. a few of these international superstars, but that, that has to do with mm -hmm. this particular mm -hmm. complexion of international markets and the kinds of rigorous channels that I was talking about earlier. So it's creating that kind of ecosystem that has both of those things together. I've got some uh, questions coming through. I'll come to them in just a moment because I know that you, you did mention education. And uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about that from, from your point of view. I mean, you're currently senior scholar at the Yale Center for British Art. So you understand the, the, you understand the world that uh, as well as the, um, the crafts world, you understand the commercial world, but you also understand how education can uh, can push this along mm -hmm. how how do you see it going uh, what are your what are your thoughts on this yeah well when i mentioned earlier that the, the time has a kind of terrifying aspect to it this is okay. one of the things i was thinking about because okay. i don't think there's any um sector that's more challenged than craft education and higher you know higher uh, education universities colleges because it's so difficult to see how you can do that from a distance in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it, even before this, it was already under a lot of stress because of the erosion of government support for those programs and the fact that they're inherently expensive. You know, if you want to have mm -hmm. a glass furnace running 24 seven or even fire kilns mm -hmm. periodically, that's a lot of money. Um, you know, that the, the, it's a lot of investment. And mm -hmm. so my great mm -hmm. fear with this, uh, pandemic for the sector really has to do with the educational base, which is so crucial because it's really through these higher education um, organizations and entities that we get the next generation of people coming along. You know, yes, you have your self-taught folks out there, um, like Joseph Walsh, for example, but mm -hmm. for the most part, you really need to have a higher education framework that's intact and stable and healthy in order to produce the kind of infrastructure that I'm talking about. Um, so how do you do that? Particularly, sorry to cut across you, but I remember um, I, I work as an arts journalist and if I had a pound or a dollar for every time it said, uh, and this is pre-COVID-19, yeah. uh, what is the point of uh, this theatre space or what's the point of giving money to that? When it could be going to a hospital, when it could be going to a school, how how now in in light of what's happening in the world can can you argue that having a kiln is absolutely necessary uh, in order for people to be taught yeah well i think there's two ways of doing it one is the more narrow uh, economic case that can be made yeah. and craft yeah. councils are have become adept at doing that and showing that the short-term investment actually does produce a lot of long-term value. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're not locked into a kind of immediate gratification system, it makes every bit of sense in the world to create those world leaders through a short-term investment now. Mm -hmm. So that case is being made, I think, very persuasively if people are there to listen. Obviously harder to make that case when you have a very stressed system in general like we do now. Mm -hmm. I think there's another, um, another way of looking at it, though, which is that my view is that the higher education system has been led by the nose to be very competitive with itself and not to think in terms of collective action. And what I often will try to encourage is for different universities in an atmosphere of declining government support to realize that fighting with one another over that declining support can't be the way forward. And there needs to be more lateral communication and, and collaboration between different um, between, between different um, schools. Mm -hmm. And that's, 
that's the way to do it. So to decide that one place will be the center of excellence for ceramics, another place might be the center of excellence for glass, another place mm -hmm. for textiles, and build mm -hmm. those centers accordingly, rather than everybody doing everything badly. So mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a proponent of that kind of, um, I guess, sector-wide, frank, open, honest communication and collaborative work. Is the sector willing to, to listen to you? I think that's one area where the pandemic is pushing in the right direction. Okay. Because okay. I think it will force that to happen. And again, unfortunately, one of the triggers is that the government's lack of top-down support is going to um, really prompt that sort of grassroots collective action because it's the only roadmap to survival. I apologize for the fact that so much of our dialogue is about the pandemic, but it's kind of writ large in, in all our lives as we emerge blinking out into it. Masked, uh, going to the hairdressers. I managed to get there even the other day <laughs> after about seven months and had that strange experience of having the mask on and the, the, yeah. the hairdresser having the, the visor. And, and that's something, I mean, the craft response. To, to COVID has, has it been remarkable or is that just what you or anybody else working in that industry would have expected? Oh, no, I think that has been incredibly uh, it's inspiring to see. Yeah. Um, you know, all the masks I have are handmade either by my, my partner or by my aunt, who's a great crafter. Um, and I think a lot of people would say that, that the masks that they ultimately have ended up wearing eventually, even if not at first, were handmade. Maybe they learned to make them themselves. And that's not an isolated case either. There have been a lot of, um, a lot of stories coming forward about fab labs, which are you know, these small digitally powered studios associated with the maker movement that have leapt into making personal protective gear. And one of the advantages that they have is that they can be right on the doorstep of their local city hospital. And so they can say, well, what do you need? And then we'll go and make it with our laser cutters and yeah. deliver it to you tomorrow. And there have mm -hmm. been a lot of cases like that. So, um, you know, again, it's not a total solution for the problem of a lack of preparedness for a crisis like this, but it is very indicative that when push comes to shove, craftspeople are the ones you need. And if you don't have a high incidence of craft in your community mm -hmm. and you've given up on local production, then you are exposing yourself to all kinds of risk because mm -hmm. craftspeople are the first responders, literally. They are, they are part of that, that emergency system. So we, we lose them at our extreme peril and it has been a great demonstration of that. That's so wonderful. Well, look, I'm, I'm seeing now, so bear with me if I hopefully don't knock us off off air. Um, I'm going to go to the Q&As. Uh, and so, okay, so let me see. Uh, Leo Cullen has, has uh, sent in a question. Um, he's talking about Irish linen and tweeds uh, for Philadelphia Museum of Arts Craft Show, Craft Boston. Uh, he took part in some, all by passing the official NI in Irish craft and design. Uh, very interested in independent channels to access shows and potential customers. Um, yeah. What do you what do you make of that? Uh, he was able to bypass the official channels. Yeah. Well, I think it's a that's one of these uh, both and situations rather than either or. Mm. So I, yeah. I would certainly want to um, uphold the importance of the gatekeeper organizations, yeah, yeah. partly because you can't really have the kind of rigorous storytelling that I was describing earlier without having mm. gatekeepers to do it. I mean, that's just mm. the way it is. That's why we have curators and why we have yeah. support organizations. But I think also um, it's crucial to realize that that's not the only game in town. And it's obvious and important thing to say that social media is part of that. And then these online platforms like Etsy at one point was one of these I think that's now become a sort of debased coinage perhaps, but um, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a lot of maybe even a distressingly complicated number of these other independent channels that Leo's mentioning. And it's mm -hmm. just one of the skill sets that you have to have as a successful yeah. maker. You have yeah. to be able to not only identify one or two of them, but actually a whole mm -hmm. group of them and weave them together into an income yeah. stream. Okay. 
Let's go for another one. Uh, Stephen O'Connell says, I really enjoyed an article by Glenn late last year in Crafts magazine that featured fabulous images of Matt and Abby Bankster's home. I'd be interested to hear Glenn's thoughts on craft in domestic interior settings. Yeah, it's great that uh, Stephen caught that article in Crafts magazine. Um, and Abby Bangser is a, a wonderful curator here who runs a fair called Object and Thing, which includes design and craft together. Um, so she, she, you know, had a lot of advantages in putting together that home, <laughs> I'll just say. Um, and her, her husband is an art gallerist. So, um, but you know, for the mere mortals among us, um, I, I always think about the fact that craft is a great way of introducing aesthetic meaning into your home actually without spending a lot of money, yeah, yeah. you know? Mm. Um, and of course you can get a spectacular object if you have the means to do it, mm. but it's very, very different from art and even from design in some respects mm. in that the entry point is really, really low. I mean, low in terms of money. So okay. I, I think it's, um, it really is the single best route by which people can make their home into a more, not even a, a more aesthetic environment, but literally a more meaningful environment, mm -hmm. meaningful to them, because it's a way of inscribing stories into your, mm -hmm. into your own domestic setting. Well, talking about things that are meaningful, uh, as part of the, this uh, in conversation, we've asked each of, of my guests to choose uh, an object that means something. So we have a photograph of it that can be put up on screen. So can you, Glenn, tell us a little bit about what we are looking at? Yeah, so I, I chose this object precisely for the reasons that we were just describing, because um, it's one of my favorite ceramics. And I do have lots of ceramics by people that I know and love, and it associates to particular personal connections, like you were saying earlier. But I thought this would be a good example because it was so incredibly cheap. <laughs> so this okay. cost me a few dollars. And, you know, I appreciate that some people might not even have a few dollars to spend on a plate. And I want to be very aware of that, mm -hmm. um, particularly at a time when people are going to food banks, you know. So mm -hmm. I realize that many people aren't in the position to be able to even to acquire this. But um, this is just something that I found on, through an online seller. And I just think it's so marvelous, um, mm -hmm. particularly to hold, which of course the problem with Zoom is we can't do that, but it's very thickly potted. And it's about, I'll, show, I'll hold it up. So it's this yeah. big, ah, so maybe okay. two or seven inches in diameter. Yeah. Okay. On your side. And what's <laughs> interesting about it from just a geeky ceramic history point of view is that it has a Shino glaze, a Japanese type of glaze, very popular in Amer American studio potters going back to the 17th century. And then it has these blue stripes, which are made using cobalt. So this is the same colorant that classic Chinese porcelain would have had. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, does have to this day. And so it's this very interesting, actually quite unusual combination of the uh, materials that one would associate with one ceramic tradition and also those associated with another. So it's kind of taking a lot of yeah. ceramic history and putting it into a small compact package. And it's also just lovely to hold. It has this very kind of warm, so-called uh, orange peel texture to it. It's just great. I love using it. I use it almost every day. And What do you um, use it for? I talked about um, my porridge. What do you use yeah. it for? And I have a bowl, by the way, that I use every morning that was made by a potter called Warren McKenzie, which I could easily have chosen also. You know, I mean, it's a plate, so I put whatever I put on it, right? It could be hard boiled eggs, it could be, you know, my sandwich. So, and, and I guess it's also the fact of using it almost every day that makes it meaningful to me. It's like, a, you know, it's like getting in the same bed every night, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Inherently reassuring. <laughs> It is, it's, I absolutely understand what you mean, inherently reassuring. Glenn, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, oh, there's another question coming through. I, I don't want to, um, ah, yeah, Christopher McHugh, you got me just before I was about to say goodbye. Glenn, do you have any suggestions on how university craft courses can adapt 
to the current situation of online hybrid teaching. And that's Chris, and he's from Ulster University. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot to say about this. I'll try to keep it short. Um, well, first, again, to recognize the inherent challenge of doing it. However, if we remember that craft is about thinking as well as making, mm -hmm. I think this is a great time to invest in the history and I would even say the theory of craft. And, you know, I've been part of this, but there's a whole generation of writers that's come along in the last 10, 15 years who have um, given us so many different ways of thinking about the field. So I think that given the hiatus um, and the fact that many people are going to be disconnected from the making part of what they do, um, I think is a great time to read. I think it's also a really good time to remember that the distinction between professionals and amateurs is at the end of the day quite arbitrary. And in a funny way, it's kind of turned us all into amateurs again, because we're all just sitting at home, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we don't have the expensive facilities that might be at the university. Mm. And so thinking about the very basic DNA of creativity and encouraging students to think about what they can make with very little and that kind of innovation, that sort of, um, you know, focused right up from the very fundamentals kinds of creativity. I think that's another important thing to do. And it so happens that those two things pair very well together. So what can you make with just what's in your kitchen drawers? And then how ambitious can you be intellectually in the way that you're thinking about the whole project of being a craftsperson? Those two things to me seem like natural counterparts. So if I were in the challenging situation of trying to run a craft course right now, that's the way I would be thinking about it. I wonder, you know, with all our talk of sourdough bread and banana bread and, oh my goodness, uh, uh, that just was a bakery and then things that, that you, were you were making in order to just keep kids entertained and also try and keep their mental health, uh, you know, manageable during lockdown. Will we actually see uh, a generation come out of this who have a better uh, understanding of and appreciation of craft? I think so. I think it's very likely. I mean, again, it's all down to parenting styles. I don't yeah. have kids myself, but I think, you know, the point that I was just making about what can you make from your kitchen drawers, mm -hmm. nobody's better at that than a child, yeah. you know? So I think it's also maybe not so much what we're teaching our kids, but what we're learning from them. Yeah. And of course, kids will be stir crazy right now. And anybody uh -huh. listening Tell me. <laughs> for that, but there also will be moments when, you know, not being hooked into a screen, but instead really being encouraged to just make things up as they go along in some kind of material experimental way it could be a really great way of getting through the time. Final question is comes through from Claire Mooney. Claire, thank you. Any recommendations for new writers to have a look at as Glenn mentioned? And she says, thank you. Oh, so many. <laughs> I mean, I definitely would recommend checking out Crafts Magazine because it's, they do a great job. The yeah. edit, their editors there um, have been doing a fantastic job there. Yeah. So they do support new writers. I edit something called the Journal of Modern Craft, and we're mm -hmm. always trying to forward new, new um, scholars there. And then there's kind of particular people that have come forward, you know, I think about Catherine Rossi and Stephen Knott who were two PhD students of mine who are doing excellent work now. Um, but boy, there's so much out there and so much to discover. So, you know, if you're in the right frame of mind, um, you will find it. But as I say, I, I would start with um, a more scholarly approach as the Journal of Modern Craft and a bit more accessible, maybe Crafts Magazine. Definitely check them out. Glenn, thank you. I mean, the Crafting Conversation series is part of a full program of events coordinated by Craft NI. So do go and look us up online. Uh, and uh, hopefully the next time we talk, uh, you can play us a tune as well. Uh, you, yeah. what, is your, what is your instrument? I actually play the Ellen Pipes, the Irish Pipe Pipes. Wow, yeah. excellent. And, and of course I also play the whistle because it's a very similar set of yeah. fingering. So, yeah, uh, and doesn't, so you don't have to do as much uh, putting the wind and I'm sure there's a better <laughs> description. Anyway, but Ill 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 uh, pipers are a clear example, I'm now pointing at you, a clear example of uh, passing on the tune or the ornamentation uh, or, or something. It's, that's a really strong, strong link. Glenn, it has been 
a real, real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Same here. It's been a real pleasure to be on. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye.